Hello and welcome to Nagaland TV. So, Bandu Lagawas. Today, I'm here to talk about Mr. KK Sema. He is a retired IAS as a director of social activists. He is a very good person. He is a very good person. In 2018, he was in the constituency of INC, Indian National Congress, and the election was in the election. He is a very good person. He is a very good person. He is a very good person. Tak boleh aja. Enak kalau kamu ini tay INC parti de tak gigi na, tay resign guru gigi na aja. Itu orang ini dia amikan ikut adu dah kuthak guru lagi na aja. Tu ahi bi amikan ah kuthak guru na cadam de tay laga reason tu jani lobo. Hello and welcome to Nagaland TV sir. Pula tu amian jani umum cadu. What was what made you take the decision to leave the party? Well, I think I'd prefer not to talk about all the internal matters of what was good, what was bad. The only thing that I would like to say is any organization that wants to succeed must be led in a proper uh, structural way where leadership is conscious of exactly what is going on and the reason why we are failing. All of these particular aspects of governance within the party itself is a very important thing. Now, unfortunately, in a simple way, I would say that, uh, well, the people who are more ready to be loyal to the leadership are the ones who are put in position. and. Uh, you see, when you put it in the simple term, you call it nepotism and uh, psychophancy when everybody is so, you know, everything you say is yes, you know. And then when people who think differently come into the fray, the leadership is not happy with those people who would object to one thing or the other that doesn't do well for the party. And so it's very, very difficult because for me, I'm more than prepared to appreciate what is done well. And I do not have the patience for something that is not upright. And uh, when this loyalist and the psychophancy kind of things take over the organization, I find it very, very uncomfortable. And so I decided let them carry on the way they are doing. but. From the perspective of uh, a party having to grow in a state like Nagaland when it is so stupidly corrupted, we do not even have the proper grassroot, uh, grassroot uh, workers, you know. And uh, the time when I had gone into the election myself, I thought Congress would have that solid grassroots networking, but the reality was entirely different. And therefore, there is a serious need to create a grassroots working mechanism where you get good people to work in various uh, zones and create the momentum for the party. Those activities are not on. So the only people that are clustered around the, uh, the, the president and the general secretary and everybody talking very highly of them as a loyalist, you see, you get distracted. And I don't quite <laughs> like the kind of environment to work in. And so I thought it's better I let them carry on in the way they are doing, in whichever way they like, it doesn't matter. I have only wished them well, hoping that they will improve upon whatever they do, but that I didn't want to continue working as a political party. The other aspect is, uh, I would, at my age as a senior citizen, I would prefer to remain a free man and be able to express myself independently without any kind of inhibition because when you are tied up with a party, whatever you are saying, as honestly as you want to convey, it is still being 
defined through a political window as if you are still a part of a political system and uh, it devalues whatever you are saying as well you know so i thought it's best that i leave politics aside and talk to our people share with uh, share the thoughts that i do have once in a while with our people as honestly as as frankly as i can put it and uh, that's a much better social service than being in politics where you just have to keep on fighting being corrupted in order to buy votes you have to be a corrupt human being those things are just something i don't feel like meddling in anymore so i, I have left with a free conscience i didn't want to continue okay so uh, was there any uh, specific drawbacks from the party's end drawbacks as i have told you uh most of the time the focus is in delhi you know with the aicc and the party leaders going up to delhi for whatever but when we as a people in a state need to want to grow the focus should be intensely in the grassroots uh, situation there is no focus on that you see and all the time wanting some kind of an attention from delhi has been more the system within which the grassroots people are just all lost you see so i uh, i don't really see why play in a team knowing well that you are continuously going to lose see and uh, right now as i said congress has been out of power for so long and uh, they are just not going to be competitive enough even if they work very hard in the grassroots level also even if they work very hard setting up the grassroots it's still going to be a very uphill task but they are not even working on that their focus is on delhi so that's the kind of drawbacks that we see that uh, is not a healthy thing so i had prefer to just leave it to them and let them do whatever they want the way they want it so apni age the condition i do apni do do you have any thought of joining any political parties or you are completely leaving politics no i i've decided to i've decided to wash my hands of politics uh, i do not intend to join any party or go for any kind of elections as far as i'm concerned i have touched it with my own hands i have seen it with my own eyes the unfortunate part of uh, the electorate irresponsibility selling of votes that is the most damning thing and i have always said you know even a rat without a brain if he has got money will will win the election you see your cows your dogs your cats provided they have money they are uh, capable of winning the election in nagaland so why make yourself a fool joining the rat race as it were <laughs> so i'll not be joining any political party neither will i be involved in any elections in the future i've had enough <laughs> so uh apni ekta social activist pe se so uh, i would like you to ask as in would you like to convey a message to the people of nagaland with regard to the naga solution Look I'm afraid this is in fact much much more important an issue than my resignation from the Congress party and I'm glad you asked this question because you see Nagas have been completely dominated and lives have been destroyed with this consistency of unreasonable taxation that the factions have been imposing on our people and therefore I can understand that the totality of the masses uh, having suffered for so long now wants an early solution and that is the common feeling everybody is having this you see but the one thing that i would like our naga people to sit down quietly and very carefully assess what i'm about to say because i'm not making conjectures i'm not going to say anything uh, fictitious but something that is concretely on the ground okay 
the issues on the ground where I feel the Nagas of Nagaland and people are brothers from beyond the state of Nagaland feel bad when I say Nagas of Nagaland. But the fact of the matter is when the, the whole negotiation is revolving around a big picture called the bigger Naga limb as I am used to call it, you see, it is all a picture of unreality. No, it's not real. You see, firstly, you talk of sovereignty. The government of India, in the framework agreement also, talk about the uh, shared sovereignty, uh, two identities, and so on and so forth. <coughs> NSA and I makes a huge noise about it. The one thing that NSA uses is half-truths and does not share the other half of the truth. Shared sovereignty, as far as government of India is concerned, is that India is a federated union of states. So you have the central powers called the central list, the state list, where the state has authority, and there are concurrent lists that governs a constitutional approach to the managing of a nation. So every state has certain amount of authority, which they call, if you want to define it, as shared sovereignty, okay? So they are talking from that perspective. NSC and IM also talks of the same thing, but talks as if uh, Nagas are going to get shared sovereignty, which is more or less equal to complete sovereignty, which is not. The full truth is shared sovereignty. Yes, we will have autonomy in a good number of things, but it will still be under the Indian constitution. But now let me explain, and this is what I'd like our Naga people to clearly understand, instead of being impatient, we've got to learn to decide what we want, clearly know what we want, before the actual agreement is signed. And there are two issues that the IM has already declared, okay? One is that the state of Nagaland will cease to exist, okay? Because it's going to become a nation, according to NSA and IM. That is one thing they have already declared publicly that is part of their competency clauses. The other part of the competency clause that, that they have made public is the Pan Naga Hoho, okay? This is a conglomeration of uh, Nagas from everywhere within the state of Nagaland and outside from Manipur, Arunachal, Assam, all coming together in a forum that's called the Pan Naga Hoho. And uh, it will be created through an act of parliament as a statutory uh, authority or body which is going to be purely cultural according to the government of India. It is just a cultural body. But the IAM has shifted that cultural body definition to that of a more authoritative kind of a organization going to the extent of saying that in the Naga nation there will be the upper house and the lower house and the Pan Naga Hoho will nominate, will nominate members into the upper house. The lower house will be our elected members, okay? So NSANIM's Pan Naga Hoho will nominate members into the Rajya Sabha, that's number one. Bills that is to be passed by the lower house, the elected representatives, cannot be passed without the approval of the upper house the members of who will be loyal to Pan Naga Hall, okay? So any bill that is detrimental to them will be not approved by the upper house. So they control the whole policy system within the state of Nagaland, you see? Now here the, the part that needs to be understood is when they say Nagaland is going to become a nation with the two houses, that's one, they are talking about a Naga nation without the integration of Manipur, Arunachal, or Assam boundaries into Nagaland. Hmm? They are not talking about uh, 
geographical integration, you see, they are only talking about the population integration under the Naga flag that is to be in the state of Nagaland minus all the other land that belongs to the Nagaland uh, state beyond our state, you see. So what happens is because there is no integration, the government of India has conceded to give them autonomous regional council huh? in uh, uh, Manipur and in Arunachal. They will have the autonomous regional territorial council. They will get funding from the government of India for their administration, development, for all management. They'll get that privilege, okay, because integration is not involved. And so our brothers from uh, Manipur and Arunachal will have a special privilege of their own. But because the state of Nagaland is going to become a nation for all Nagas, it becomes a com common homeland for everybody, for the Nagas of Nagaland and our brothers across the boundary in Manipur and Arunachal and Assam, you see, as a nation, you see. And that also gives them the privilege as a citizen of our Naga nation, where in terms of jobs, contract, or various other facilities, while they enjoy their own, in their own autonomous region, or, or, or all the privileges, they will also share the same privileges with us in our state that becomes a nation minus integration. And so when you people want a job, they are also entitled to compete. Hmm? When their contract was to be uh, floated, tender is floated, they are entitled to also uh, compete. Every aspect of development, jobs, and every other thing, they will become a part and parcel of the nation by virtue of Naga becoming a nation, you see. Then the young generations for us as elders, the next couple of years or whatever time we have left, uh, we may not suffer that much. But decisions planned out by the NSA and IM, especially our southern brothers, in the fashion in which the present peace uh, negotiations are going on, if what I have explained just now is going to be a part and parcel of the final solution, are the Nagas stupid enough to agree that we fight so many years to get rid of uh, uh, Indian colonial power and then it gets replaced by our own brothers who do not belong to the state by virtue of the geographical boundaries. They don't belong here. And the simple truth is what they are saying, the, the NSCN's IMS theory is, they will have their own privileges in their own area. So mine is mine, but yours, yours is ours. You see? Because they will participate with you and me in our nation called the state of Nagaland that becomes a nation. They will enjoy the same power again, privileges again with us. You see? Now, are the younger generation, Naga younger generation still unable to see through the depth in which the IM is planning for a continued grip on the state of Nagaland. And the young generations are going to have to compete with our own brothers from outside the state of Nagaland hmm? as the final decree that will apply forever for me, my children, my children's children, and the generations to come. That principle will be applied because this is the final solution, yeah? And therefore, I'm asking the younger generation. You see, I don't care about whatever does happen, really. No? After all, how many more years to go? But if it's going to be a destructive uh, agreement within which all the youngsters in the state of Nagaland are going to be put into those kind of uh, uh, loss of opportunities to our own brothers from across the boundary where they have their own privileges and yet want to enjoy the same privileges with us, I think that is not a fair deal 
And now my concern is, these are the two issues that have been made public in the competency clauses of uh, NSE and I. Now, there are so very many more. Competency clauses have so many more other things being taken into account. They are not showing that to the Nagas. Hmm? The NSE and I is not showing that. The NNPG, seven NPGs, they have clearly laid down exactly what they are asking the government of India, and they have made it public. Why is the NSA and I not able to do the same thing? You see? Now, it worries me because if the ones that are declared is as dangerous and damning as the two issues that I have already raised, how many more of such a thing could be there in the competency clauses? So since they are negotiating on our behalf and for us, we are the stakeholders. See, they are not... The NSA and IM is not negotiating with the government of India for their own cadre welfare. They are talking about the total population of the Nagas. Hmm? And the stakeholders have a fundamental right to know exactly what our future is going to look like. It is imperative, it is important, and it is a must. And therefore, the people of Nagaland must stand up and ask NSA and IM to clearly let us know what our future is going to be before signing the agreement, not after. Hmm? What is the use of showing us what has already been finalized? And if it is finalized like the Naga nation belonging to everybody, while they enjoy their own privileges in their own place, huh? at the same time control the whole management system in Nagaland through Pan Naga or by controlling the upper house, who has to approve everything, you see? How are the Nagas of Nagaland going to survive? Hmm? It's as serious as all this. So do the younger generations still want a quick solution hmm? without knowing what those solutions are going to be? Will it be detrimental for them or not? See, without knowing all this, we are just only simply saying we are tired. We want government of India to give us a solution quickly. Well, I say we better think seriously again. Hmm? Because what is decided today is going to be applicable for generations to come. And I, for one, am more than prepared to say, let it take another 10 years more, 20 years more. But as long as we do not know exactly what are the terms and conditions in which we and our future is going to look like, I say we must stand up. And in fact, as a people, we must all stand up together and make IM understand that they are negotiating for us, the stakeholders, not for themselves, not for their cargo. Hmm? And therefore, it is their duty and a responsibility to show their competency clauses to the Nagas first before they go into a final mode of agreement signing, right? And so this is the message that I want to share with the people. I think we must now all stand up together and ask NSC and IM to be a proper representative of the people by letting the people have the confidence in them that they are doing the right thing by showing us exactly what they are asking for. Now, is that too much to ask of them? Hmm? It is our right, our future. Hmm? They cannot dictate terms on that area and say, have trust in us we will decide your future without telling you. Now, Nagas, uh, we seem to be devoid of the courage to be able to stand up for whatever we believe is right. But this is an issue we cannot be cowed down with fear. Hmm? We have to clear-headedly evaluate what the ground reality and whatever I have said is the ground reality. I have spoken to the uh, senior people among the NSA and IM, and whatever I have said comes from those discussions that I have had with them, and what I've said is what they intend to do. That's the message I want our Naga people to know. We've got to know exactly what is in store for us before the signing of the agreement, not after. And NSA and IM has to be pressurized to let us know that one simple thing, do not decide our future without telling us. 
as the stakeholders. So let the whole population and all, and I'm mostly appealing to the younger generation, your future, your future is directly going to be the area of impact because you're going to have to compete with everybody else from everywhere else, our Naga brothers, do they enjoy their own privilege. They will compete with you, our children, you see. If you agree to that and say, we still want a solution, then go right ahead. Hmm? That's what I will tell the younger generations as well. But it's time that the younger generation also begin to get involved, understand the reality, and begin to stand up for what is right as a people and as a generation who is going to suffer the consequences of, of all this. Okay? So let this message go to the younger generation. Let them see in what way they want to react after I have said whatever I have said. That's all I need to tell you. Okay? So that was in conversation with uh, Mr. Kegyesima, a retired IAS and a social activist. activist. Thank you so much for staying with us. This is Kermido Nungdi with my video journalist, Bendang Sinaf for Naglan TV. Piles Cure Center, address Burma Camp, Walford Road, opposite Police Point, Dimapur.